Hey there, everyone, and welcome to Maho Profile. Today, I want to lead off with a quick apology. Last episode, I said I was going to cover two shows next, but after watching and researching both shows, I ended up having so much to say that I felt it necessary to split them back into two episodes. So, sorry to anyone who was hoping to hear about Sarutobi Etchan today. That is in the pipeline for next episode. With that out of the way, we can dive straight into our featured show for today, Pushigina Merumo, aka Marvelous Melmo. This series comes to us from Tezuka Productions and debuted in October 1971. It began as a manga series by Osamu Tezuka called Mama-chan, which was also the heroine's name. However, according to the official Tezuka site, when work started on the anime, the name Mama was already registered and therefore not open for use, and so the series was renamed Marvelous Melmo, starting with the October issue in 1971. The heroine's new name, Melmo, highlights her transformation abilities, deriving from the Japanese pronunciation of the word metamorphose. Metamoru hose, me -ru mo. While it's fallen into obscurity nowadays, Marvelous Melmo was pretty significant to the histories of both the magical girl genre and anime as a whole. It was the first magical girl series produced by a studio other than Toei. It featured the first magical girl whose power focused on transforming into an older version of herself. It was an early example of anime mixing narrative and educational material, a la Moyashimon or Cells at Work. And... <sighs> it was one of the earliest anime to make frequent use of panty shots, or panchida. And when you realize that the titular Melmo is only nine years old, you start to get an idea of where the show might run into some trouble. Before we get into that, let's go over the basics. Melmo Watari is an elementary school student with two younger brothers, Toto and Tach. At the very start of the series, literally minute one, episode one, the sibling's mother, Hiromi, is hit by a car and killed. In the afterlife, she begs to go back to Earth, worried about how her young children will survive without her. The powers that be, in their spiffy star suits, grant her one wish for her family, and she wishes to give her daughter Melmo the ability to grow up and take care of her younger brothers when needed. The gods grant her a bottle of magic candies crafted from the yolk of a phoenix egg. And for those familiar with Osamu Tezuka's other works, yes, it is that phoenix from the manga of the same name. Connections! <laughs> Back on Earth, Melmo and her brothers have been placed with a grouchy, abusive aunt who hates children. Melmo despairs, but then her mother appears to her as a spirit for a tearful reunion. She gives Melmo the bottle of candies, explaining that a blue candy will make her ten years older, and a red one will make her ten years younger. Melmo tests out the power of the blue candies and treats the audience to the first of the show's many, many uncomfortable panty shots. Seriously, was the butt wiggle necessary? Taking two red candies transforms her into a baby, though she still retains her nine-year-old mind. She almost eats another red candy, but wisely decides not to test her luck. So Melmo becomes her older self and confronts the abusive aunt, claiming that she's Hiromi and that she's come back for her children. The aunt tries to sick some goons on her, but with some quick thinking, Melmo uses blue candies to turn the goons into old men and frighten them away. All seems well after that, but soon Touch gets a hold of the candy bottle. He eats some blue candies and turns himself into, well, a literal man baby. In a panic, Melmo accidentally feeds him too many red candies, and this ends up turning him into a zygote. Welp, guess that answers the question of whether you can go too far back or not. Melmo comes up with an ingenious solution to this problem, though, by dissolving a blue candy in water. She puts the zygote in the water so it can absorb the candy's magic, and we watch Touch grow from an egg back into a baby... very... very... slowly. that Marvelous Melmo was a sex education show, by the way? Yes, at least once per episode, the story will diverge into short educational segments depicted through either painted still images or lovingly rendered growth sequences like this one. 
Most of the segments attempt to teach something about reproductive biology and the life cycle, including bits about puberty, gender, falling in love, parenting, and how if a human being could return to a single-celled form, they could tap into the foundational structure of the universe, swirling through the stuff of stars and all the blueprints of mere existence, to be reborn in a new and glorious form as from the very soup primordial. You know, standard stuff. Also, that last bit is exactly how Melmo is able to use the candies to turn into animals. Like I said, very science, much rigor. Wow. So Melmo finally grows touch back to normal baby size, and this time it's Toto's turn to steal the candies. He runs outside with them, and... <sighs> Look, I wish I could explain this whole caper because it's very good. But we have a lot to get through today, so I will just say it involves a murderous driver who tries to run Melmo over, and Melmo rightly uses her powers to invoke the fear of God in him, traumatizing the man into swearing off all cars forever. Magical girls, mother The episode ends back at home with adult Melmo giving Toto a bath. Toto is still unsure about all this, and sure enough, he soon susses out that she isn't his mom. Melmo drops the act and explains her secret to him, making him promise to keep it so their abusive aunt doesn't get them or their house again. Toto promises, and so episode one ends with a stage set for... well, something. From here, the series is less episodic than the Toei Magical Girls series up to this point have been, with major status quo changes and callbacks to previous episodes happening throughout the series. We get the introduction of a mentor figure slash guardian for Melmo in episode four, a doctor named Waregarasu. In the same episode, the doctor gives Melmo the idea for taking bits of two candies at once to transform into animals, a power which she uses throughout the series after. The death of Melmo's mother is continually returned to for episode plots, such as an episode where the boss of the man who ran her over appears to want to make amends for what happened. This episode also features the return of Melmo's awful aunt, who features in this and one more key episode before the end of the series. Several characters whom one would only expect to see in a single episode make minor reappearances throughout, reinforcing that they don't just disappear from Melmo's life after their one featured episode. The gods in their star suits also reappear a few times throughout the series to watch over Melmo's progress, sometimes punishing her if they feel she hasn't been using the candies responsibly enough. This leads into a major plot thread towards the end of the series, where the candies stop magically refilling at the end of each day because this miracle that the gods have created will not last indefinitely. This ties in with the series' themes of growth and change. The candies cannot last forever because nothing does. The magic of childhood must someday give way to adulthood, which is difficult but often wondrous in its own way. In any case, status quo shakeups aside, the episodes still tend to follow one-and-done structures that allow viewers to tune into just about any episode and not be too lost. There will pretty much always be a new problem of the day for Melmo to tackle, the candies will be involved in either worsening or fixing the situation in some way, and the story will eventually tie into whatever the dubious sex ed lesson for the day is. Oh yeah, and Melmo will probably get naked at some point. Child form, adult form, doesn't matter, they'll find a way. It's... yeah, it's... <sighs> Jeebus crime in Japan, don't do this to me. <sighs> now, you may be thinking, well, hey, it's a sex ed show, of course there's going to be nudity, what's the problem? The problem is the framing. There is plenty of nudity in the educational segments, and that's all very frank and fine and dandy. And to be fair, there are also narrative segments where the nudity is tasteful and on theme, like when Melmo bathes Toto in a parental way, or when she tries to breastfeed Baby Touch. But then you get stuff like Melmo's transformations. First off, yes, Marvelous Melmo technically had the first nude transformation scenes, predating the infamous nude transformations of Cutie Honey by a couple of years. What makes these transformations more uncomfortable than Honey's, though, is that Melmo is still mentally nine years old when she transforms. And the transformations really tend to highlight the sexuality of her adult form, both visually and musically. No, really, the transformation theme ends with a literal sexy saxophone riff. Also, if a male character is in the room with her at the time, even if they know Melmo is a child, they will try to... <clears throat> 
sneak a peek, as it were. Gross. The weird thing is, you would think the show would know better. One of the very first educational segments shown is about the differences between children and adults, and it very clearly points out that the major difference there isn't just physical bodies, but the amount of experience and wisdom each has. Hey! Hey, Tezuka Productions! If you understand that what makes a child a child is largely mental, not physical, then why do you think it's okay to sexualize a child just because she has an adult body, huh? Huh? Say something, you perverted Okay, okay, I'm calm, I am calm, okay. But seriously, for a show that presents very literal life lessons in every episode, Marvelous Melmo ends up teaching the audience a lot more than it perhaps intends to. Having watched the entire series and taken in all of this valuable learning, I would like to demonstrate this by sharing 10 of the best nuggets of wisdom this show has to offer. Lesson 1. If you want to change someone's age without asking first, that's totally fine. Be they a dog, an elephant, a goose, or a person. As long as whatever they were doing inconvenienced or hurt you in some way, then irreversibly changing them into an egg, or a baby, or a decrepit husk without their consent is A-OK, -okay, and absolutely not a form of horrific cosmic torture. I mean, they brought it on themselves by being kind of a jerk after all. Lesson 2. It's extremely easy to throw small projectiles and land them exactly where you want them. If you can't land a tiny candy in someone's open mouth on the first try, every try, then clearly you're just not trying hard enough. <laughs> Lesson 3. Always go along with shady strangers, no questions asked. Doesn't matter if the last strange people who came up to you said they were taking you to a world conference, only to then spirit you away to a fascist dictatorship. Or maybe told you they had a sweet luxury apartment they wanted you to watch for them, only for it to have actually been a front for their mass pickpocketing spree, which you then became the scapegoat for. Or they came dressed to you like a literal Dracula and promised to bring your dead mother back to life, only for your resurrected mom to have actually been a wax doll implanted with the soul of a snake. And then the snake soul mom actually began to care about you to the point of immolating herself to save you from freezing to death in a snowstorm. Nah, it's probably okay to just keep saying yes to strangers like that. Benefit of the doubt and all. Lesson 4. Picking your nose hairs is gross, and no one wants to see that. Stop it. Stop it. Lesson 5. If you accidentally turn your brother into a frog with magic candies, there is absolutely no easy way to reverse this process. Frogs can't eat candy or drink water after all, so clearly not even dissolved candy water will work for them. Never mind that frog skin is water permeable and they just get the water they need by absorbing it. <laughs> nope, absolutely no way the candy water could work that way. You'll just have to leave your brother stuck as a frog for nine entire episodes, causing him to have an existential crisis about whether he'll ever get to grow up and go to school and lead a normal life. Before you realize, oh wait, frogs can breathe, right? So just evaporate the candy water into steam and have him breathe it in. Easy peasy. Okay, yeah, that was less of a real lesson and more an excuse to talk about this subplot because seriously, Toto gets stuck as a frog for almost a third of the series. Status quo changes indeed. Lesson 6. Sometimes the solution to a problem is to get in a prop plane, impregnate a giant devil flower, and then set the devil flower on fire to destroy both it and its offspring for good. Enemy is great. Lesson 7. 
The best way to get away with any crime scot-free is, of course, to become a baby. Because, well... Lesson 8. Sometimes if someone gets bullied when they're young, that doesn't make them more sympathetic to other victims of bullying. Their problem is less with the bullying and more the fact that they were bullied and not someone else. I'm not even making a joke here. This episode where Melmo turns a bullied puppy into a grown dog and then he in turn bullies others is really, really well done. It's a shame that it takes the puppy's mom sacrificing her life for him to show that what he's doing is wrong, but still. Man, this show has a lot of dead moms. Anyway, this episode feels very prescient of a lot of the toxicity you see today in internet culture, politics, media, everywhere, really. A lot of people who experience mistreatment, or even just perceive that they've been mistreated, do not learn empathy for those who have suffered, and instead turn that around into a conviction that as long as suffering is inflicted on the correct people, it's all fine, even enjoyable to perpetuate. But go off about Magical Girl shows not having any strong real-world messages or themes. Lesson 9. Gender. It's... Okay, I can't even make a good joke here, so I'll just be serious. Being a sex education anime from 1971, this series presents an... outdated understanding of gender, let's say. It is specifically outdated in regards to number of genders and ideas of biological determinism for those genders. I can't blame the series for not foreseeing decades of advancement in scientific and social understandings of gender and sex, but yeah. Still worth bracing yourself for that when you head into this one. And a lesson 10! If you're hitting on a nine-year-old girl, and you're old enough to drive a motorbike or car, that is... apparently absolutely fine! In fact, it's probably not just you who's hitting on her, she's clearly just such a fox. And at that point, you and her other suitors will be well within your rights to demand that this small child choose one of you to go out with. And she will! And it'll be treated as sweet and romantic! Because she'll grow up to marry you and have your child eventually! And that's just fine! No problem with that at all! None whatsoever! <sighs> Anyway, there is so much more I could get into with the plot of Melmo, but I will leave it there for time's sake. Needless to say, like Maho no Mako-chan before it, this one's a bit of a weird one. It's almost for that weirdness alone that I hope this one makes it back to English-speaking audiences someday. And yes, this did once see an official English release. In recent memory, even. It used to be legally streaming on Viki, and even now you can still get to the show's episode pages if you Google them. Unfortunately though, it appears the episodes themselves are no longer available. At first I thought maybe they were just region locked, but people in several other major regions have confirmed that they don't work for them either. The episodes are out there in some of the seedier corners of the internet if you're that desperate, but for those who prefer to watch their anime legally, that option sadly does not seem to exist anymore. However, even if you do get to see the show, you probably won't have seen the original version. Like I said, Melmo first aired in 1971, but a renewal version also aired in 1998, with cleaned up animation and an all new voice cast. This was the version used in Vicky's streams, and while the Japanese DVDs feature the dub tracks for both versions, it seems like they exclusively use the cleaner animation of the renewal version. Compare the original and renewal versions of the opening theme. The original theme song was performed by Chikako Idehara and Young Fresh. It uses mainly brass and string instruments, has more childlike vocals, and the image quality is noticeably washed out. By contrast, the renewal version was performed by an adult vocalist, Yuki Mashima. It uses more synthesized instrumentals, has a cleaner, more vibrant look, and features a small tag on the logo saying Renewal in Katakana.
For those of you who speak Italian, you can find a few Italian dubbed episodes floating around online. Unlike the Italian dub of Maho no Mako-chan, this version of Melmo, entitled I Bonbon Magici di Lili, or Lily's Magic Bonbons, was not that heavily censored, which is odd, considering how much stuff in Melmo is potentially censorable. As far as I can tell, it's pretty much intact. Così vi scalderete. Poi arriverà qualcuno. Così brucerai tutta, morirai. Non fa niente. Se potrò salvarvi, sarò felice. Ricordatevi di me. Mamma! Just goes to show how far the educational banner goes towards justifying content that might not otherwise make it to air. That the show aired with so little issue in Italy is interesting, considering how it's said to have been received in its home country. A popular anecdote holds that many parents in Japan hated the show and complained to the network after their kids started asking a lot of uncomfortable questions. I couldn't find much hard evidence for these claims in English, so I can't say for sure how much truth there is to that. But a 2004 review from the Japanese magazine CD Journal claims that PTA groups called the show disgusting. Iarashi. This quote appears on the Amazon listing for the Japanese DVD release, and is thus the most official confirmation of these anecdotes I could find. What can be said for sure is the show didn't last long. Only 26 episodes, airing from October 3rd, 1971 to March 26th, 1972. It was the first series produced by the newly formed Tezuka Productions, which was then a spin-off company from Osamu Tezuka's original studio, Mushi Production. Melmo would be Tezuka Productions' only full-length series until Mushi Productions filed for bankruptcy in 1973. The defunct Mushi Pro then transferred all of their animation departments over to Tezuka Pro, making Tezuka Pro the main animation company for Tezuka-related works going forward. Tezuka Pro pulled in a lot of talent for Melmo, many of whom were just starting long and fruitful careers in the anime industry. One example was Yoshinobu Nishizaki, who would rise to fame in 1974 as the producer of the classic sci-fi series Space Battleship Yamato, and then later rise to infamy with the likes of Odin, Space Sailor Starlight. Nishizaki was Osamu Tezuka's general manager during Melmo's production, and was mainly responsible for selling the show to a network. The rights eventually went to Asahi Broadcasting, and as Nishizaki recounts in a 1981 interview, he felt a sense of responsibility for the show even though all he did was sell it. When the audience ratings turned out to be even worse than he imagined they might be, he felt deeply ashamed of himself and from then on vowed that he would eventually create an anime work that he would not regret. Slightly more involved in the production was Yoshiyuki Tomino, who directed episodes 5, 16, and 22. Tomino wasn't exactly a new talent at the time, having started with Tezuka doing scripts and storyboards for the original Astro Boy in 1963, but he was still a couple of years away from his debut as a main series director on Triton of the Sea, and about eight years away from creating the work that would define his career, Mobile Suit Gundam. This was also prior to him earning the nickname Minagoroshi no Tomino, or Kill em All Tomino, referring to the sheer number of character deaths that tend to crop up in his stories. Thankfully, there are no deaths in the episodes Tomino directed for Melmo, although episode 22 does go into the dark subject matter of alcoholism and familial abuse. The ending of this episode is perhaps overly hopeful on that front, but it's still one of the standout stories of the entire series. You may have noticed I've barely said anything about the big Tez himself, so to speak. And that's because, honestly, it's intimidating to even try talking about him. There is already a wealth of resources out there about Osamu Tezuka that can tell you so, so much more about the man, his work, and his influence on the industry than I ever could. And they can do it more thoughtfully, critically, and eloquently to boot. If I dove headlong into Tezuka here, even just for an overview, we could be here for an entire series unto itself. So apologies if you wanted to hear about Tezuka in more depth, but for now I'll just focus on what his manga for Melmo was like. The manga is fairly similar to the anime, with many stories being adapted directly to the anime. A key difference between the manga and anime, though, is that the candies not only change Melmo's age, 
but also grant her clothing for various occupations that she tries out in her adult form. For example, when Melmo tries to become a stewardess to board a flight to Africa, in the anime we follow her going to great lengths to sneak into the airport, find a closet to transform in, change into clothing she brought from home, and take a stewardess flight exam in order to board the flight she wants to get on. In the manga, she just magically transforms into a stewardess and gets on the plane with no issues, similar to how the disguise pen works in early episodes of Sailor Moon. In general, the manga version of Melmo rarely has to worry about her clothes not changing with her, which is… nice, I guess? On the one hand, the strict realism of the candy's rules in the anime is more interesting to watch, since the writers often get very creative trying to work within their bounds. However, the manga does have a lot fewer of those discomforting panty shots, so… yeah. Remember kids, there's a reason we don't worry about the mechanics of the Hulk's pants, and I would prefer not to worry about Melmo's clothes on that front either. The manga didn't last long. It was reprinted in 2018 as a single hardcover collector's edition called The Marvelous Melmo Treasure Book, which contains materials recently discovered by Osamu Tezuka's daughter, Numiko Tezuka. This includes several chapter layouts, sketches, and color illustrations that never saw the light of day until this year. Unfortunately, this book is Japanese only, and I was not able to look at a copy for this episode, but I would love to see it someday. There does appear to have been a second Melmo manga serialized in 2010, simply titled Melmo-chan. However, I can't find much information about this manga, other than it was written and drawn by artist Keiko Fukuyama, and it ran in monthly comic Ryu. And it apparently had the cutest Melmo ever! Oh, look at that precious! Please protect this darling angel! Oh! Um, <laughs> but yes, if anyone does know more about this or owns copies, let me know. I would be really curious to read it someday. Anyway, outside of the main anime and manga, Melmo never resurfaced much outside of some star system appearances in other Tezuka works. She had cameo appearances in Blackjack, Unico, and Rainbow Parakeet, and prior to the anime airing, her adult form played a role in the 1970 manga Apollo's Song, there appearing under the name Hiromi Watari. Apollo's Song is considered to be another part of Osamu Tezuka's Sex Education Trilogy alongside Marvelous Melmo and Yakepachi's Maria. So yes, Melmo was not an outlier on this topic for Tezuka, to say the least. Melmo's animated appearances after her solo series were, weirdly enough, both in advertisements. The first was in an extended music video made to promote an electronic album. No, not Interstellar 4 5, although that would have been a wild crossover. No, this was an 18 minute OVA called Ravex in Tezuka Land, which promoted an album by the Japanese band Ravex, and also celebrated Osamu Tezuka's 80th birthday. The short features Ravex meeting up with various Tezuka characters, including Astro Boy, Blackjack, Kimba, Unico, Princess Sapphire, hey girl, welcome back to Maho Profile! And of course, Melmo. Together they use the power of music to defeat the evil Soggies or whatever, and everyone celebrates at the end with a big dance party. Yeah, there's not much of substance here, but it is nice to see Melmo animated in a modern digital format, and with a cool futuristic outfit to boot. Also cool to see her in so many scenes with Sapphire, highlighting their shared magical girl heritage. Please look at these two very good and wholesome girls. Just look at them. And finally, as far as I can tell, Melmo's most recent animated appearance was in an actual commercial. In 2013, Japanese dietary supplement company Wakasa Seikatsu very briefly had a licensed product called Merumo Love which claimed to rejuvenate women's beauty like Melmo's candies rejuvenate her age. And they produced this animated commercial to promote it. That's… well, it's a little weird, but honestly, what about Melmo isn't weird? I get the concept, and it's cute for what it is, so there you go. So yes, that wraps us up on Marvelous Melmo. This entire series is a treasure trove of bizarre logic, baffling science, creative situations, and honest moments of human connection. 
Also, I didn't get to say before, but compared to the toy series we've seen so far, the animation is really a step up, too, with lots of uncommon angles and uses of camera movement, as well as an interesting fluidity to the character motion. It has some very troubling aspects, which I think I've made very, very clear. However, if you go in knowing that it's a product of its time and brace for some of the discomfort that comes with that, it's a very engaging watch, honestly. There's a reason Osamu Tezuka and his production team are as venerated as they are. For all the criticisms you can make of the man and his work, he knew how to tell a strong visual story. And next time, we'll be hopping from one humongously influential creator to another as we get to the long-promised episode on Shotaro Ishinomori's beloved magical ninja girl, Sarutobi Etchan. Look forward to it, and I hope to see you all again soon! Thanks so much again to all my patrons who support me every month, especially Anna, Author X, Julia and Kyle, Lavitz, Otaku no Podcast, Rally Vincent, who deserved better. And by special request, here is my very best Akko transformation phrase. Tekumakumayakon, <clears throat> Tekumakumayakon, steki na YouTuber ni nare! I wouldn't be doing this if not for the generous support of viewers like you. You can support me on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash Aaron Cerise. You can make small one-time donations at ko-fi.com slash Aaron Cerise. Or you can always share this video and leave a like or comment to show your support. Thanks so much again, and have a good day! Goodbye!